We go back in time with Vacheron, we go Greenwich Mean Time with Seiko, we get a fast quarter mile time with Matt Farah and the Smoking Tire and Nodis, plus we catch up with Pietro from the limited edition about a brand new watch from Atelier Event. All this and more coming up on the show today. Welcome to the Scottish Watches podcast. This is the episode where I make up for my ill-gotten past. There was a time, not so long ago, I was at a global red bar event. I was under the weather and Dave had to take the bat on and run with the show. Well, now I get to return the favour in 2023, just before the new year, don't I Dave? Dave feels like shit. That's the best way to describe it. Pardon my French, but yes, David is not feeling the greatest person he's ever been. So finally he gets to return the favour to Ricky by passing the bat on at the last minute and saying... It's now your problem, not mine. And the good news is, I have already got a feature with Pietro. I've already got a cool feature in that will be included later on. So there's hardly anything to record just now. But we wanted to get this show out before the new year, before we do our end of year review. And I'm very glad we're not trying to do that today because Dave would be out of puff before you know it. But anyway, if you're new to the show, welcome. Be sure to follow along at home. There'll be show notes in the YouTube video description. Click that, takes you to our website, to a specific page that is designated for this episode where you'll find all the pictures, the link the tech spec and it turns out the spelling of the brands that we speak about because we got an email during the week from a listener who went absolutely crazy at me because I did not spell out or you did not spell out the name of a brand and I thought to myself but we tell you to click the link and there's a spelling in the show never mind anyway you know what to do now and that is it and if you're watching this on youtube we'd appreciate it if you subscribed click the notification bell so you can find it when new episodes drop because we don't really have a schedule it's whenever i can be bothered whenever i can be arsed whenever gav can be arsed and whenever we've got new content but we are starting to get through stuff we've uploaded a whole load of episodes over the festive period and that will keep you going into the small hours of hogmanay but uh, we should probably catch up with seiko because they released some news of a watch but it's only now just become available so in the new year I'll be paying the guys down at James Port and Son in Glasgow a visit because I got a nice text message off Simon and the crew at Christmas time there to say kumbaya this would be the Seiko SPB411. This is their new LAN series watch, which does make a bit of a departure from what I think it's fair to say has been their savvy fare for the last couple of years, which has very much been divers watches. But they're beginning to make a bit more of a focus on their Landward series watches. Obviously, the Alpinist has been a core part of the range for a couple of years but a lot of their watches I think it would be fair to say are definitely dive orientated but those compass bezeled watches and the more land series watches have taken a bit of a back seat and been a bit of a kind of like funky little side aversion to what their main core range are but they've suddenly decided to take a bit of a more centre stage and this one is one that I think definitely appeals to myself and I'm sure will appeal to many of the listeners out there. Now what have they done? They've brought out a watch that harks back to I believe the late 1960s where they had a GMT watch that did certain things but didn't make a huge kind of wave in the ocean shall we say. This release is very much unlike a lot of the things I've done before, which have very much been reinterpretations, one of Seiko's favourite phrases. This is definitely more core to the reissue, I would say, of the original than they've maybe done necessarily in the past. Obviously, lots of the original diver watches have been either very faithful reinterpretations, albeit at a price, or kind of modern reinterpretations of it at a much more accessible price. This one seems to be something that is a fairly true homage to the original, albeit at more of an original price point. I think this one comes in in and around the $1,500 price point, but in terms of size, specification, aesthetic and look, it's much more true to the original than maybe some of their past reinterpretations maybe and I know I've used this word a few times but I'm feeling rather rough and I'm using Seiko's terminology whether that be re-edition or reinterpretation. Ricky it's very grey probably not your colour palette but what do you think to this? I like it. I like the fact that it doesn't look like all the 62 mass paddy diver reinterpretation, reimaginations, to use a couple of words, Dave has used 14,000 times as well. I quite like it, but I don't think it's my favourite Seiko. 
And they release so many editions that it's very difficult to pin down. It's analysis paralysis for me with this. But it does look good in the renders, it does look good in the pictures. And if Simon and the crew do actually have it in stock when I go across in a week's time, I'll be sure to bring my new little mini camera with me and get some footage of it so people can see what it's like away from a studio setting. 38.5mm, 45.2mm lug to lug, 12.5mm thick, 19mm lug width. Now, if ever there was a Seiko lug to lug or lug width, 19mm is definitely a Seiko lug width. I've seen this and I can affirm that James Porter indeed do have this watch in stock. It was a good month before it arrived into stock after it was released, but I can say that probably towards the end of 2023, it's one of the few editions that they've released in 2023 that I've thought to myself, mm, David, keep your wallet in your pocket, keep your phone in your pocket, keep Apple Pay away from that PDQ machine because I really like it. It's a really good looking watch and it's one of the probably best releases I would say Seiko have done probably in the last 18 months. So if in doubt, get your wallet out. If you're me, keep your wallet well away from the PDQ machines of favoured retailers because you're likely to buy it. But yes, in a week's time, unless they've sold it, that is, you will not be disappointed. It's now time to move on to the next thing you want to talk about. I'm wanting to talk about something you might want to talk about because I've got a watch here and it's in a very special colour. Is it orange? It's orange. Give me it. Certainly give me is. It. I'll have it And now. it's a limited edition. No, no, you can't have it yet. Because it's not out yet. I don't actually know how we managed to get this, but it's not out. I don't think it's even down for pre-order until the start of January. So this is one when you guys are going to have to put a note in your diary, set an alarm, a notification, if you're interested in this, to jump on and put your name down for it. So this is a watch that we get sent across from the folks that know this. We've had Wes and the crew on the podcast a number of years ago. And every year, without fail, they send us something cool to look at. It doesn't matter if it's a sector sport, if it was the new edition, the previous Mark One edition. There was a really cool orange Halloween watch they sent across last year to look at. And this is the latest and the greatest. It's the second collaboration with Matt Farah from The Smoking Tire, another previous guest of the show that has been on a long, long time ago. He's known out with the car world as perhaps the gentleman that introduced Joe Rogan to good quality wristwatches. He's been a guest on the Joe Rogan podcast a number of times, introduced Joe to Grand Seiko amongst other things, Panerai's, all the rest of it, and that's why if you spot Joe wearing a cool watch, it's probably down to Matt. This screams out Dave Sharp. It is really well put together. If you've ever seen a notice watch in the past, you know exactly what you're looking at. The attention to detail on the dial with those applied markers with their polished outer, inner loomed, the fact it's got a Fume dial, it's got the hidden markings for the minute track in the rehot that you can't really see too well straight on, but as soon as you tilt the watch, you see it. it's got the chamfered edges, it's got the multi-link bracelet, and uh, although this one is a press piece, therefore it's slightly scored on the back, it has got the smoking tyre logo. This one looks to be one of the ones that definitely is in the Dave Sharp book of aesthetics. Or anaesthetics, as it turns out today. Anaesthetics. Anaesthetics would be quite good right now. But aside from that, as you mentioned, not available right now, but definitely available from around mm, the 1st of January at 12 p.m. PST. Delivery from late January 2024. I can't believe we're actually talking about 2024 already, but there we are. That's where we're at. Coming in at just shy of 1,200 US dollars. There's only 200 of these pieces available globally, and these ones are designed and they're actually assembled in Los Angeles. Assembled being the pertinent word. The case 316L surgical grade stainless steel case, 41 millimeters in size at 11.5 millimeters thick with 47 millimeter lug to lug and unlike Seiko using a rather more sensible 20 millimeter lug width. That means that if you don't like the bracelet, not to say there's anything wrong with the bracelet, but if you fancy maybe more like a, I don't know, a rubber strap or a leather strap on there or something colour coordinated with a dial, it's not going to be the biggest problem in the world. Movement wise, really quite perky. A La Juperet G, 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 G101 movement. It's 
screw down crown, you've got the sapphire glass on there as you would expect. Fixed bezel, nothing moving on there, so nothing to let any water sneak into that watch. You've got a really nice taper as well, so as much as you've got the 20mm at the lug, it tapers down to 16mm, and you've got that proprietary clasp on there as well. Yep, I think this is a rather tasty looking watch. Obviously at US dollars it's... Not super entry level, but definitely in the attainable end of the spectrum. That is if you're one of the lucky 200 people that manages to get on board with this. So I'm liking this one. It has to go back. It is a loner and I think it has to go on its travels around the world because they don't appear to have many of the press samples since there's only 200 being made in total. There is an uplift in price versus the notice of the past, but the notice of the past used to use an NH35 movement, not a Swiss made Le Jeu Pere, which seems to be turning up more often than not these days. There's a hell of a lot of brands dipping their toe in the water. Uh, Satari Ballard's using it. There was a few guys we mentioned recently. So it's nice to see folks moving up the way. And there's that sort of designation point where they're doing this at a low cost, and the guys that have been doing it for a while are starting to move more up market. But uh, we should probably talk about my final day in Zurich because we had to cut things short. Last time we got to talk about our IWC trip, got to talk about the Moser Museum, the factory, precision engineering, hot launch, and me picking up my latest watch and my final watch of 2023. But as Dave decided he was going to go home earlier because he was heading to London and I was heading back to Scotland, I went for a wee wander the last day in Zurich a couple of weeks ago. And if you've never been there, which I haven't, and you like watches, then the high street is laden with the best of the best of boutiques. We're talking everything. I didn't have a chance to go in 90% of what was there, and I was just cherry-picking what I could go in. Tried to go into Patek, but it was completely full, and they turned me away, only because it was completely full, not because it was me. They didn't know who I was. Everything else that was there was just absolutely top-notch. Let me quickly run you through what you will see if you go across. So the first port of call is Booker because when you go in there, there is one in Geneva that me and Dave have been into a number of times. They have different, it's like a department store for watch brands. They've got all these different levels where you go in and they've got Tudor, they've got Breitling, then they've got Carl F. Booker, then they've got Norcain, Ulysse Nardin, Moser, and it just goes on and on and on. Then they have their pre-owned stuff, which could be anything at all. And then they've got the really elegant high-end things where you could find anything from Roger Dubois up the way. So that was fantastic going in there. Got to try on a watch that Dave, I don't know if Dave has it or he likes it or he would like it, but it is the green ceramic Aston Martin edition Gerard Perigo. The smaller size, not the large one. Have you actually got this watch? Have you been looking at it? No, David does not indeed have the green ceramic one. It has to be said that David is rather partial to the green ceramic one. Dave has uh, a couple of uh, Gerard Perigos, much to the chagrin of uh, Ricky, who has slowly but surely come around to the tastes and applique of uh, the brand. But yes, the green ceramic one is one that has eluded David so far. But um, it has to be said that if it comes across David's offerings at the right time and the right offering, he may well take them up on it. Well, I can agree. It is fantastic. And I've said in the show before, there are a few more GPs that are kind of starting to appear in front of me that I'm being slightly tempted by, as much as there is a big house move on the go in a few months' time, so I have to be very careful what I do. I know I'm a silly boy most of the time, I'm going to have to be a good boy for a couple of months. From there, I went across to the Omega Boutique, had a look at some of the stuff in there as well. The staff in Zurich seem to be at a slightly higher point than most places across the world. And again, I'll remind everybody, when I go into places, I don't say anything. I don't tell people that I'm involved with a podcast or anything to do with the watch industry. I just like to go in and be treated as a normal member of the public to see what people are like. And the sales assistant in Omega was fantastic. Got out a number of watches for me, gave me their latest... It's not even a catalogue, it's a magazine that detailed all about their museum. I got a nice cool bag, which in any other city in any other place in the world would probably be a bad thing walking out of an Omega boutique with a large bag but I felt quite safe because I was in Switzerland and I was in Zurich and it was a Patek place along there and it was an AP place along there so I thought it would be fine 
Got to try on one of the Moonshine Gold Speedies, the full Moonshine Gold number, and a diamond bezeled one that didn't look out of place, it didn't look small, it didn't look like a feminine piece, so if you check the show notes you'll see pictures of this, and if you're watching on YouTube the chances are you're seeing it right now. Now you said full Moonshine. I'm assuming you talk about one of the more recent Moonshine editions, which is a Moonshine case, a Moonshine bracelet in fact, but maybe not a Moonshine Gold dial as there's only ever been one of those. And I don't want to be smarmy about it, but I'm going to be smarmy at this point in time and say, you may have seen a green dial, or a panda dial, or a black dial, in fact. But did you actually see a moonshine gold dialed variant, Ricky? Or are you just being, for once in your life, subservient to Monsieur Sharp? Have you got one of these, Dave? Yeah. Well, one of these? okay. has David got one of those? Okay, no. Who knows what 2024 oh, right. we are going for bring. modification. David might be modifying himself in many ways. I know it's going to be an amazing 24 for Divina, but we'll move on and we'll talk about the rest of my trip to Zurich. So getting back to the cool watches in Omega, it was really nice. And I moved from there with a happy buzz about things. I went into Ublo. Do not judge me. I know there's a lot of people that like to take the piss out of Ublo. They do it regularly on YouTube. It gets a lot of clicks, etc. But there are some watches they do that are absolutely fine. And I've said before that some of the case designs, the way they've worked with sapphire, ceramics, different materials, different substances, they do it well. Yes, okay, some things are a little bit garish, some things are very expensive, but if you like the look of a watch, go for it. And there was a particular watch that I saw limited to 200 pieces, and it was in this black colour, and it looked almost like a faceted diamond. And you'll have to look in the show notes to find out more about this, because it was incredible. And the name of this watch was the Hublot Big Bang Sang Blue All Black. And I think it was around about the $26,000 mark, £26,000. Came out of Hublot, wandered along the road and went into Vacheron's, not, not their flagship boutique, but one of their bigger boutiques. Again, Switzerland, obviously, everything is bigger and better over there. And was greeted by the staff in there who knew everything. The folks here in Scotland, the people in the UK, they know a hell of a lot. But the guy in there was talking to me about the progression of the Vacheron logo across hundreds of years. At one point, it almost looked like the Gucci logo, the way they changed it and played around with it, the typeface, the font. It was just really nice to speak to people that were so passionate about what they do. And again, they must have hundreds of people every week, thousands of people perhaps coming through and asking them dumb questions like I did, but they had the time to answer everything. And at the end of it, they actually gifted me a Vacheron book, which I took home. Thankfully, I had space in my carry-on. I did weigh things. We were all good. From there, wandered along and went into AP's flagship boutique, which, again, it was just incredible. It was like going into a sweet shop as a four-year-old kid. I got a tour by one of the ladies that was there. She took me through all the different models, the releases, told me the history of various iterations, right up to present day with 1159. And I was just on a high. Ended up walking into a place where they had all these customised Rolexes. And this wasn't from George Bamford this time. This was from a brand called Pro Hunter. And they had everything from a sub to a GMT to a Daytona. Went inside. Again, the people in there were very kind. They spent a bit of time with me. Got to try on a black Daytona. Didn't buy anything. Wouldn't buy anything. If I was going to get something like that, I would have a word with George. Because he knows more about this than I do. And I think from there, I ended up buying a Christmas gift on the way home. Which was a Swatch Donut Simpsons edition. Had to go through three different places to actually find one. Because the Swatch boutiques were sold out. And I asked them to check. And the actual shop inside the airport was also sold out. So they pointed me to a couple of department stores. And on the second attempt, I managed to pick one up. That was about it. I um, headed to the airport. Went past a huge, massive Moser sign on the side <laughs> of the airport. Just to remind me of where I had just been. And that was it. Jumped on a plane. It came back home. Got things sorted out for Christmas. And that was pretty much my little Zurich trip. Dave was slightly earlier than me, heading down to London. I get back to Scotland and got on with the festivities. You may have missed an incident that involved losing a wheel whilst at the airport. I mean, I gained a watch and I lost a wheel. So that's a good kind of deal in my book. But yeah, as I'm waiting for all the carousel luggage to come through, I spotted my Lieutenant Dan minus a wheel. 
And it wasn't just minus a wheel, it was minus the corner of the case. I don't know what had happened to it, they'd been peckish on the way over, but I was quite happy. All was good, I was back home and everything was fine. Should we probably talk about what Dave has been up to? And I'm going to go easy on him because he's not too well. So you can just give us the sort of rough cliff notes of what's been going on, Dave. What's Dave been up to? So Dave got back because Dave, in fact, had, as a lucky individual, had to go back via London because Dave had been invited very generously to his favourite brand that's not the brand he works for, that being Omega, to a little Christmas do. And he went along there, probably drank way too much at that event and stumbled home, then made his way back to Scotland. And David's had a very relaxing Christmas. Rather than being dragged around the multitude of family that David has, David just chilled out which is a first to be honest because usually David goes rushing about for three to four days of making sure he's ticked every box that's possible to make sure that everyone is happy with him and Dave for a change decided to just go easy let's go easy and involve the people that are important to him other than that what's Dave been up to not a whole lot, to be honest. Uh, he's been trying to think as little about watches as possible, which means only every 15 out of the 60 minutes in a day. Outside that, yeah, not a huge amount. Uh, Ricky, what may or may not you have been up to? Please tell me you've not been thinking too much about watches over the Christmas break. Yeah, I have. I've not been thinking too much about editing podcasts or recording podcasts or editing videos or doing photography, but I did do a lot of that. But I tried to stop doing that. There was three days where I did none of that, which is pretty good considering what I do for a living. But uh, I did all the usual stuff. There were some video recommendations. I watched a movie called The Creator. Everybody had been hyping this up as a kind of low-budget, very good sci-fi movie. Turns out it wasn't that low-budget. And if low-budget to everyone these days is $85 million, then I'm in the wrong game. But this thing was shot, and again, it was talked about, it was shot on the Sony FX3, which I believe is the camera that beautiful Dave is currently looking at us through. And it is one of the shittest films I have seen in a long time. And I'll say that with the caveat that if you were to go through it and cut out 10 minutes every 20 minutes, it'd be a really, really good film. I read a review afterwards on IMDb because I like to go through things and double check that I am correct, which I always am. But I do like to confirm that. And somebody wrote, a lot of things happened, then it ended. 5 out of 10, which is exactly the way I would say it. Looks cool. Story could have been better just far too long. I watched the Die Hard, which is the ultimate Christmas movie. Do you like the sweatshirt, Dave? Do you like the sweatshirt? Dave, Dave is saying, in fact, two thumbs up, because Dave also watched at least twice Die Hard, because it has been shown in both... Can Dave see what's going on in the screen there? No? Dave, Dave, Dave saw that going on in the screen there, because Apple is Dave doing his Dave Apple got a type warning thing. Dave a couple of weeks Apple, ago. Dave got his Apple type thing going on there. But yes, Dave watched mm -hmm. that very much debated as to whether it is or is it not a Christmas movie. Dave, I'm going to jump in here, right, because we're trying to get through things really quick and we've got Vash to talk about. I will just quickly say it is. And I had this argument at the Christmas dinner table with, with friends and family. And a person said that Die Hard is not a Christmas movie. Just because it's filmed and set on Christmas doesn't make it a Christmas movie. It's not a feel-good movie. And I said, you know what? You're wrong. Tell you why. It starts off with John McClane at odds with his estranged wife and by the end of it they were back in love they were back together and they were kissing and it was kumbaya and he was going to see the kids that's a Christmas movie so a done deal watch that um, there's a great quote within the first little bit where <laughs> Holly is presented with a watch for Christmas and the guy that takes a lot of uh, marching powder says to Holly show John the watch so there you go it's a watch movie at Christmas what more do you want uh, Jason Kamiza on the Haggerty Channel icons great youtube video on mustangs the history of them right up to the dark horse that's out just now that is an incredible machine for christmas got some cool watch gifts i got robot dog or robo dog or something like that it's supposed to be down on all fours but i've got it kind of perched up because he's really really happy and dave's got one too well dave also has the robot but i believe what you may be thinking about is yours the dog or the robot it has to I be said doggy walky because it's going so to be happy you, tale. Have you also got this Annoying. little beastie as well? I think that's what this is, but I'm kind of holding it in a human form, something like that. So Ricky got that for Christmas. Ricky also got from the same fiancé, there only has one fiancé because she listens to the show, I got a really 
interesting Raketa Big Zero that has almost got a hologram dial to it. Vintage number there, very cool gift. I got a really nice t-shirt which I will wear on the next show because I'm wearing this cool sweatshirt today. News-wise, an absolute shocker came out of nowhere and that was in the latest edition of About Effing Time. At the very end, some word appeared on the screen that said you have just watched the last episode of About Effing Time. And we know Adrian, we know George, we know Andrew. Nobody told us a thing about it. We were over at IWC with Adrian. But it turns out that the guys love doing the show, but George Bamford runs multiple successful watch companies, photography companies. He's got a whole shitload of stuff happening. Andrew McCutcheon has taken over the world with Time and Tide, recently opened a new place over in Australia, a studio. He's moved across to Switzerland. He does a lot of stuff with Omega and Tag. And Adrian has got the Bark and Jack channel. As we mentioned, he's actually got a new person that's helping him with all the video stuff. So add all that into the mix. They don't have the time, unlike me and Dave, where we do this podcast because this is my full-time gig and Dave jumps on and just rattles out the stuff like that and I do all the post. With those guys, there's the three of them, there was Marcus, there was a production team, there was the video editors, there was the guys on social media. It was just too much stuff to go on at the one time and I think it was detracting from what puts bread on the table at the end of the day. But... They will still be around. I have reached out to Adrian, George and Andrew and said, listen, if you ever want to come on here, don't worry about the editing. We take care of that. You can come on here. You can talk shit. You can say all the dodgy stuff that you used to say in your own shows and we'll do all the, the cover up. We'll make sure all the sweary words disappear for YouTube. But sad to see that go. I don't think it is completely gone. I think they will come back, they will do maybe specials or it watches and wonders, they might turn up and they might do something there and then as big grand events but you know that's kind of that as it is just now. I did ask Adrian is this a publicity stunt, we know how YouTubers like to say oh no no that's it, it's all over, wait for the comments coming in with everybody pleading them to come back and then they go oh, okay then. But he assures me no they're not taking the piss out of the public. Didn't expect that one Dave, did you? I have to say. Didn't expect it quite this early. I've spoken with both George and with Adrian since that little video came out and Adrian has very much confirmed that sadly due to the time involved and it has to be said that both myself and Ricky are well aware of the time involved in producing something that comes out on a regular basis that aside from the other things they do, they just didn't have the time to dedicate to it that would allow it to be a professional product. And I guess that they've taken the right choice, which is go out in a high. They have produced some great content and they've pushed that out over the last kind of 12, 18 months. And they decided that they really cannot, unfortunately, dedicate the time that they need to what they want to do without really materially affecting what they both do day to day. So they have decided to go out in a high and walk away, which is absolutely the right thing to do. Aside from that, yep, you know what? Good luck to those guys because they've all got their own little thing, whether it's Time and Tide, whether it's Adrian with Bark and Jack or the Adrian Barker channel, and whether it's George doing his collaborations with other brands or his own stuff indeed. So, you know, I don't think it'll be the last you'll hear of those three guys together or whether even maybe they collaborate with others. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Who knows what might happen in the future? But yeah, outside of that, we also had a little little last minute event with Red Bar Glasgow Edinburgh and Ricky and myself went along, which was a little Vacheron event where Karen, who runs a boutique in Edinburgh, very kindly invited us to see the tail end of the Vacheron Sports Heritage Collection, which they luckily had in Edinburgh. It was a nice end to the year after IWC, after Moser, this was the final, I was going to say nail in the coffin, but possibly, yeah, the nail in the coffin for 2023. We went across to the fabulous boutique in Edinburgh, completely different looking than the Vacheron place I went to in Zurich. They were saying that theirs needs to be updated. Vacheron in Scotland is only two years old. I think it was celebrating its birthday just a few weeks ago. And Karen and Ewan and the team there they had this travelling collection, which were some museum pieces, and we're not talking hundreds of years old, we're talking museum pieces from 50 to maybe 80 years old, including a triple two, one of the originals. They had one of only three overseas that came in a left-hand drive variant, and various other things. You will see pictures in the show notes. Again, great event, great people, lots of cool folks were there. It wasn't overly busy. 
which I thought it might be. I think the weather and the fact it was close to Christmas may have kept a few people away, but it meant there was room to breathe and there weren't as many viruses floating around, although Dave did manage to get something. And we've forgotten to do something that will probably get chastised by the young American, that being Miziel. So may I ask, what may or may not you be wearing in your wrists? Because as you know, I always like to come second. Well, this is a point of the show where I should do my wrist check and I should go first because you know what Dave's like. But instead of me telling you about a watch that I'm wearing, I'm going to get somebody else to tell you about a watch that I'm wearing because he's a guy that sent it up. So it's that time where we bring on an expert, in this case it's Pietro from Limited Edition, to tell us more about what I've got on the wrist today. On the back of a success that uh, a young entrepreneur, his name is Robin Talandier, uh, had with uh, this um, revamp of uh, artisan Chinese watchmaking with this uh, brand called Atelier Ven. Uh, so um, this was launched last year. Uh, they had a great, great response uh, uh, over 12 months. But because of in their DNA, there's always been the idea and the ambition not only to enhance a true craft uh, craft uh, watchmaking in China, but there, there is also the... Uh, um, the will to really um, improve, upgrade, uh, and increase the quality given to uh, to clients for the price. They are coming up now with a new edition of the Atelier Event Perception that you are wearing there, and I'm wearing today as well, uh, except that I'm wearing the first original edition and you are wearing the upgraded, upgraded version. But you are spot on. What they are trying to do here with Atelier Event is to offer real craftsmanship, uh, independent watchmaking at a very uh, accessible price point. So ideally, your first artisan uh, artisan watch could be could be the piece that you're wearing here, um, uh, Ricky. And you see many watches uh, coming your way, and you 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 have, you have tried on your wrist also within the independence of a certain uh, stature and uh, and a higher price point. And I'm. I'm sure you can agree that the level of details achieved here is uh, is somehow, uh, uh, yeah, surprising and uh, and pleasing. And this model with the blue, a uh, light blue, a uh, guilloche dial is the Piao. Uh, so all uh, uh, making reference to uh, uh, to crafts of the uh, Chinese tradition. We are sometimes misinformed and uh, and misguided uh, about. Uh, the Chinese craft uh, in watchmaking, Chinese made has become somehow synonymous sometimes of a, a cheap way of um, of achieving uh, quality in, in watchmaking. We know that you know, even some of the most famous brands, they have production plants in China, they have been having for a long, long time um, uh, to reduce costs, basically. Uh, but uh, in the process, many forget that Chinese watchmaking, you know, uh, uh, has a very strong legacy, and even when it's mixed with the uh, genuine traditional crafts, like in this case, you know the the incredible guilloche that you see on that dial, can become not only a very uh, affordable way to enter independent watchmaking, but also a great way to to wear a watch that uh, uh, is actually deserves the respect. Uh, that is in the details that you can see uh, in your hands at the moment, uh, Ricky. Well, the first thing I'm going to tell everybody is if you saw the wrist shot and you thought, that's a bit odd how that sits on his wrist there, I'll let you into a little secret. See if you get yourself some blue tack, or in this case, grey tack, and you put it at the back of the bracelet, it means you don't have to take all the links out when you're trying a watch on. So that's why it looked a little bit bulbous and massive, because I've not removed any of the links. In case anyone thinks it looks stupid, it doesn't. But the first question I've got to ask is, this guilloche dial, is this stamped? Has this been done with machine? Because I've never seen one that's done quite like this, with this kind of reflectivity. So there is a legendary character in the Chinese, uh, in the Chinese, uh, you know, crafts uh, uh, world. Uh, his name is Mr. Chong, and uh, Robin Talandier and his uh, associate in Atelier Ven, they found Mr. Chong's as a hidden gem uh, of an artisan that is actually making all these dials with his Rose Engine machines that he has acquired across the years, and he makes the dials one after the other one, like pretty much like legitimate Absolutely, is 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 actually respected as probably the best guilloche uh, artisan in the whole of Asia. You know, uh, without without uh, overstating this, but it's 
basically what what we're talking about here. So leveraging on the incredible uh, uh, the incredible stature of this uh, artisan, Atelier Ven is then uh, is then added all the you know some other incredible details like the case back that you see there, which is uh, which is cut uh, at a very very deep uh, level of details. As you can see, uh, they have. Uh, Obviously, equip this piece with a seagull, um, actually the uh, Dang Dong version of the seagull uh, movement that is actually being finished as well, because we see a lot of seagull movements that are normally, you know, a great, a great, how can I say, great movement to offer entry level watchmaking, but in most cases, uh, no one takes the pain of actually finishing the movement, whereas Atelier Ven did that. Well, let's go in a little bit of a deep dive, history-wise, because Seagull, like you said, and we've said on the show all the time, when it comes to Chinese watchmaking, it depends the price, it depends the people that are there. If you're working to an extreme budget, like some of the stuff you find online for 50 quid, 100 quid, you're not going to get the same quality output as if you spend a couple of grand. So Seagull is something that we've seen many, many times, including in Rich at Studio Underdog's creations. So do you want to give us a bit of the history of Seagull and where they got their technology from? Yes, basically Seagull, uh, very few people would uh, would know that it's actually uh, basically a Swiss manufacturer that emigrated to China in 1963 uh, on the back of uh, a strategic move um, of, uh, you know, at the time, the Chinese government, really. Uh, they wanted to build quality mechanical watches for their pilots and for, for the military. Uh, so they acquired uh, Seagull, uh, sorry, they acquired Venus at the time. Uh, the Swiss company was called Venus, uh, moved to, the, to China and kept uh, building those calibers that were available in 1963 in Switzerland. So it's a bit of a value. Uh, if uh, you know the experts maybe may criticize my comparison here but uh, just to give a, a, a rough idea uh, Valjou that moved uh, to China back in the day and they kept uh, refining the, the technology to keep these calibers going uh, so a very very how can I say respectable movement that because now is produced in series and in large numbers in China it has an incredible price for, for what it is even on the studio underdogs we, we all we were all shocked, you know, seeing those uh, those pieces equipped with these um, uh, seagull uh, uh, calibers. In that case, is a chronograph, uh, and looking so spectacular as the, as as it is. Now, the studio underdog is not particularly finished on 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 top of equipping, uh, obviously, um, those those tiny pieces. Whereas here, Atelier Event took really the the effort and the pain of uh, of going through finishing these pieces, um, creating um, a personalized rotor. And uh, as we said, then adding all the details you're playing with at the moment, um, Ricky. I want to say th their commitment to, to, to perfection is, is, uh, is witnessed by the process. They went from the first edition last year to the second edition that you have now as a preview, Ricky. You're actually the only one having this watch uh, at the moment because it's not been delivered to the market yet. Uh, it, we will start delivering in February. What they did, they sent a survey to all the clients that acquired the first edition asking them what they would improve uh, starting from, you think it's going to be ridiculous, but starting from the dial, for example, um, uh, and some clients came back with a feedback of saying, yeah, the dial is amazing, but it's not quite as good as a Votiline and dial. <laughs> that gives you the, the feeling of the fact that people buy these pieces, have been buying these pieces really with the expectations of getting somehow the, the best possible quality. What's your impression? What, what What's your feeling about it? Whenever we do things like this, I always say to Pietro or the guest or whoever it is we're dealing with, don't talk to me about the watch until I've got it in my hand and we press record because I want everything to be genuine, off the cuff and literally I unboxed this about two minutes before we pressed record and if you'd said to me it was 12 grand, if you'd said to me it was 20 grand, if you said it was Chipek money or something like that, or potentially, I don't know, Arm and Strom, I mean, even the, the bracelet, it, it's got hardly any wiggle, which is incredible. And then you told me the price and you've not even talked about how thin the thing is. And it's an automatic without a micro rotor. It's incredibly thin. Uh, the dial been actually properly guilloshed, not stamped like certain Audemars Piguet's that we've talked about in the recent past. Everything about it, the way that the sloping of the highly polished indexes are in there, the way that the pinion is capped in the centre, it's not exposed like some other watches. There's nothing bad to say about it. I cannot think of a single thing. 
it's not exactly my style as a sports watch. It's integrated, all the rest of it. It's a little bit more dressy, I think, because it's got so much pizzazz from the dial. But I could definitely see myself getting one of these. This could be my possible first watch purchase of 2024. So Pietro, if, if people don't already know where to find more about you online, what's your Instagram account and what's the website address? Yeah, so the Instagram account is the limited edition, uh, dot UK. Instagram is, uh, is not being kind to all of us trying to create good content uh, recently. So we have moved pretty much on YouTube where you can find us at the limited edition. And uh, the, the channel is, thank God, doing really, really great. And that's where you can find probably the best content if you like in the, um, independent watchmaking. And there is a website which is called thelimiteredition.co.uk. So Pietro, thank you for joining us and we'll catch you again soon. Thank you, Ricky. See you soon. Bye-bye. Okay, Dave, it's time to ask, what have you got on the wrist? If the crown doesn't give it away, I am wearing an Arnold and Son. This being the Arnold and Son big moon so this is a perpetual moon as you can see here you have this blue purple guilloche style dial i believe it's a 41 mil case it's mine so i should probably know but i think it's 41 maybe 42 to be honest with you although it is wearing on the wrist a little smaller than you may expect and as it happens we're actually recording this when we are 99 percent of a full moon so i have not artificially manipulated this watch to show the moon as it is actually where it should be for once in its life and it's telling its time almost as good from the back as it is from the front and the really little cool feature of this watch is if you see where my thumb is pointing you can actually precisely align the moon phase using this little guide on the case back so many people who do not like the asymmetry that may come from putting something on the dial this has been tucked away nicely on the case back as an amazing 80 hour power reserve it's hand wind you will notice the missing rotor here so yes it's absolutely hand wind movement beautiful finishing something a little bit different and we talk quite often on this show about the brand that is not done on the dial that's dust on the crystal as i've just wiped it away but this is the arnold and son perpetual moon i really do like that one and arnold and son have played such a big role in what we've talked about this year we did an app uh, well, we did a lot with them we met them at watches and wonders geneva watch days we spoke to them even at dubai watch week we've got a chat with lots of folks from dubai watch week that we still have to edit and put together so that's gonna have to wait until next year now it's just been so busy uh, but yeah, they do great stuff. They've had so many cool releases and that one there. I like it, but I do prefer the Christopher Ward only because I own the Christopher Ward and you own that one. Check out the back catalogue. We have got everything in there. We've got the Advent Calibre on YouTube. It's a compilation of 24 miniature videos, roughly a minute each. 24 of the watches we've been sent across in the last year, thereabouts, all reviewed in a very Tim Mosso kind of tongue-in-cheek kind of way flung onto YouTube. It's also as reels on our Instagram. We've also got behind the scenes with IWC. I split that into a separate video. If you can't be arsed with a full podcast and you just want to see the video, we did the Moser stuff and just everything. Everything is sitting in the back catalogue on Spotify, our website and on YouTube. And that is really it. We have got the end of year review coming out Hogmanay 1st of Jan. Hopefully Dave is feeling a little bit better. We're going to have to inject him a lot of Lemsips and Lucozade to get his little levels up the way. And I'm not talking about his testosterone levels because as we said, next year is Davina time. But that is it. Have a great festive period, whatever remains of it, depending how you're working and have a fantastic new year. And we will see you on the other side in 2024. Catch you there. <laughs>